Hello everyone, I am Dr. Gazal Gupta. I am a periodontist and, and an oral implantologist. I am also a laser dentist and have been practicing since the past six years. Um, thank you Dental Hub for giving me this opportunity to share my views and a little bit of information on dental soft tissue lasers. Uh, thanks to the lockdown, we've had a lot of time to exchange knowledge and learn from each other. So I just decided to take up this opportunity and talk a little bit about soft tissue lasers because I feel that there's a lot of confusion uh, regarding the indications and the contraindications and people don't exactly know where you can use a laser and where you shouldn't be using a laser. So uh, basically, we're going. To, I just want to uh, throw some light on the soft tissue diode laser, which is the most commonly owned laser in dental practice in India at least. Uh, heart tissue lasers is a completely different topic. We're not going to be touching upon it. So very quickly, I would just like to, uh, you know, talk about cases or scenarios where you can tell the patient that the patient can go for a laser and it would be much better that, than a conventional surgical procedure. So um, to start off with, uh, I think one of the best indications of a laser, where I think it's a boon, literally, is a phrenectomy. Because in phrenectomy, you are completely getting rid of the sutures. It's a completely bloodless field. The post-operative healing and post-operative, the post-operative healing is much better and faster and the post-operative discomfort is almost either zero or mild to moderate. That is for sure. I have done a lot of phrenectomies with lasers and not even a single patient has ever come back to me saying that I had a lot of pain and I could not, I had to take three times painkiller for almost three to four days. That is completely taken care of. So I think that is uh, something which can completely replace the conventional procedures. Uh, moving on to, I would say, crown lengthening. Now, the crown lengthening, again, uh, is a good indication of a soft tissue diode laser, but the problem with that is case selection. It is very important to do a proper case selection, and how do you do that? So when I say case selection, I mean you need to make sure that does this case need osseous reduction. A lot of people don't get it. So when I say osseous reduction, it means that you will need to take the bone down to maintain the biological width. I have seen people using a soft tissue diode laser to completely overzealously remove the gum tissue, get the sufficient crown height and be very happy with it and say that, oh, I did a soft tissue laser con uh, crown lengthening. But what about later? How are you going to take care of, okay, say if you're doing a functional crown lengthening and you've achieved a good crown height, you've also managed to give the final prosthesis. What will you do about the biological with violation, how you're going to take care of the linear gingival erythema and the constant bleeding from the gums that the patient is going to be complaining about. It's basically, it's it's a torture then, it's it's a trauma to convince the patient that, oh, listen, I think you need to remove the crown and then we need to do a crown lengthening and we need to make sure the biological width is maintained. So to avoid all of that, first and foremost, please do bone sounding. So when I say bone sounding, you will measure the distance from the crest of the marginal gingiva to the crest of the bone. This also has to be done under local anesthesia. It is painful. Now, as we know, I'll give you an example. Say if your distance from the crest of the marginal gingiva to the bone is around 5 mm, it means that you can safely eliminate 2 mm of gingival tissue and you'll have around 3 mm of gingival tissue from the marginal gingiva to the alveolar bone, which is optimum. So anything between 2.5 to 3 is fine. But if you have uh, the original distance itself is around 3 mm and you end up removing, say, 2 mm of tissue, you are going to end up with around 1 mm or less than 1 mm of distance from the marginal gingiva to the alveolar bone, which is violation of biological width. So it's very important that if you feel that osseous reduction is needed and uh, you cannot do it, you cannot just get away with the soft tissue gingivectomy or removal of tissue, then please go for a conventional flap procedure and get the osseous reduction done rather than doing a fancy laser treatment and then ending up ending and they just end up with regret okay uh, another thing i think operculectomy is a very good indication because uh, many a times you can get away without the distal wedge procedure you don't need to put a suture there which is a little traumatic for the patient post operatively for a post operatively for a couple of days uh, restriction of mouth opening and all of that so that is another indication again case selection is important please don't go for op operculectomies in cases where you know that the tissue, the tooth is not going to erupt and it's not going to serve any purpose. Uh, depigmentations, yes, another very good indication because it gives you a lot of control. And this is the only procedure where I feel you can get away without local anesthesia sometimes. Okay, because why? Because a topical gel that you apply on top of the gums can itself act as a chromophore. So it also numbs the area and it also acts as a chromophore leading to increased absorption of the wavelength. Uh, 
Chromophores are basically pigments in the dental tissues which absorb a specific wavelength. Like for example, in diode lasers, the melanin pigment, the hemoglobin are the main chromophores. Uh, it is poorly absorbed by water and hydroxyapatite, which is why it does not have any adverse effects on the heart tissues like the tooth or the bone. Alright. Um, Irritation fibroma excision, mucosal excision, excellent. I mean, you will have a completely bloodless field. You don't have to give sutures. It is much faster and it is very comforting for the patient because the time taken for the entire surgical procedure is cut down by almost half, right? And chyloglossia, especially if you're doing chyloglossia in kids in the age group of say, whatever, like three to eight or something like that, where the patients are a little uncooperative and you cannot uh, afford to sit and give sutures. As we know that the floor of the mouth is extremely vascular and will cause a lot of bleeding if done by the conventional procedure. So that is one uh, area where I think you can go for a laser, preferably. Um, as far as the treatment of uh, periodontitis is concerned, I think you can go for sulcular debridement using laser in cases where the pocket depth is, say, approximately up to 5 mm. Anything beyond 5 mm, please stick to conventional because you're not doing justice by doing a laser circular debridement technique because you will not be able to eliminate the disease completely. That is one. Secondly, when you're doing circular debridement, it is it has to be done in a particular way. A lot of people who are doing it for the first time end up completely ablating the external outer surface of the gingiva, which will result in recession. And this is more prone to happen if you have deeper pockets. So if the pockets are deeper, then please either go for a conventional root planing curettage or do a proper open flap debridement technique. You can use the laser uh, as an adjunct and open flap debridement wherein you can use it to remove the granulation tissue. So you can visualize the underlying bone morphology and do the bone grafting accordingly. Uh, coming to implants, I think there are two places where it is quite helpful. One is exposing the implant fixture at the time of second stage uh, surgery. And the second I would say is debridement of the titanium surface in case of uh, peri-implantitis. Now the former indication that is exposure of the implant has to be done in a right way. Case selection is very important. If you feel that you are going to be compromising on the attached gingiva, then please don't go for a laser gingivectomy. In fact, don't go for any kind of gingivectomy, raise a flap. Make sure you have completely raised a flap, have a full thickness flap exposure and then create attached gingiva. You can either go for a roll technique or you can augment the uh, gingiva with the help of a free gingival or a soft tissue uh, connective, subepithelial connective tissue graft. So these things go, I mean, for the long term, these things are very beneficial. Otherwise, you will end up with an inflammatory component on the buccal side all the time. It can also lead to peri-implantitis in the long run. So these small things which you need to take care of prior to using a laser or any kind of gingivectomy at the time of second stage surgery. Uh, another indication I think at the time uh, in case of uh, orthodontia where you want to place brackets in partially erupted teeth again lasers are very helpful but again it's better you take a CT scan because sometimes the teeth are covered with a layer of bone which you cannot remove with the help of laser so you have to plan the procedure make sure you have a CT scan and only then go ahead with it now in cases where it's partially visible yes you can easily go ahead with uh, removing the gingiva gingival tissue from that area you can immediately go ahead with placing the bracket simultaneously because there is proper hemostasis and you can visualize it and there is no way that it will get contaminated the same goes for class 2 fillings where uh, you know you have an interproximal gingival growth and once you remove it you cannot do the filling immediately composite because of the blood that constantly keeps no matter how much you try and control it while you're placing the band while you're placing the wedge it is going to bleed Lasers are a boon in such procedures and you can actually avoid one entire appointment by doing that. Right. So I think what else? Um, root canal procedures, it can be used as an adjunct. It can definitely be used as a adjunct to the BMP and the irrigation that we do. It helps in root canal disinfection. It doesn't really play a very direct role in root canal, but it there's no harm in using it. I mean, you can always tell the patient that you're do, doing something extra. So it will help you market, market yourself also and, and the fact that you are keeping up with the technology. So yeah, that's about it. And uh, low level laser therapy is also beneficial in certain cases. Um, like in treatment of uh, post uh, in hepatic lesions or recurrent aphthous ulcers also heal faster by subjecting them to low level laser therapy. 
because they promote healing better they there's more they have more of an anti inflammatory component so that is also one uh, very good indication of lasers i think um see i think uh, lasers have definitely added value to the practice and it is good to have a laser in your practice uh, but case selection is extremely important i think case selection is something that a lot of people are going wrong in and that's why they start seeing things like lasers are not good enough or there's no point in having a laser no that's not true so you need to first of all make sure that um you know where you have to use a laser you need to know the limitations of lasers also if you are interested in practicing laser dentistry my advice would be to please go and get a hands on training done from a reputed uh, service provider it could be anybody but a training is very important because without that you will end up making mistakes because uh, you know laser dentistry is not just about wh- what uh, where i can use the laser or how i can use. basically it's about keeping all the parameters right there are several things which you need to keep in mind there's something called as power there's something called as peak power there is something called as emission mode there are three kinds of emission mode continuous mode pulsed mode pulsed mode is again divided into three types so you need to know which kind of mode is helpful where and people who already have a laser and have taken some kind of training for them i would say if you have an inbuilt settings already there you can directly start with it but sometimes depending upon the extent of melanin pigmentation depending on the patient the fibrousness of the tissue you might have to uh, customize the settings so my suggestion would always be to start from extremely low say 1 1.2 watts and then gradually increase depending upon the requirement of the patient and don't promise things like we will not use injection we will not need local anesthesia you tell them what is what will be beneficial to them but don't over promise things that's about it so i think that's it um if you have any questions related to soft tissue lasers uh, please feel tr- free to get in touch with me otherwise uh, um i think all the best and have fun with lasers thank you once again thank you dental hub for this wonderful opportunity and i really appreciate it take care guys bye